Uh, so the next uh, speaker is a good friend of mine and uh, a vascular surgeon from uh, LA, a former president of the International Society of Endovascular Specialist, uh, <clears throat> Rod White. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a vascular surgeon, but he's a super expert in uh, imaging, uh, which is kind of unusual for a vascular surgeon. He started a long time ago, and his um, favorite topic is uh, intravascular imaging. So Rod, please. Thanks, Jonko. Uh, thanks, Alan, too, for setting this up. This is uh, inviting us into your house. This is very impressive. Um, intravascular ultrasound has been around a long time. It's one of those topics when you used to give this talk, nobody would show up or even believe it was going to work. Um, <clears throat> these, uh, w when you look at intravascular ultrasound now, currently, there's several places, and I'll try to run through these quickly, uh, as to where it's useful. But it, it gives us first off a view from inside the vessel of transmural anatomy, which was the first thing that really made it look like it was going to work. And then the other is uh, identification of side branches and being able to do that without contrast. And where clinically now it's become more important, uh, and I think people are willing to use it as in the dissections uh, to be able to show us entry points and the dynamic nature of the flap. In venous imaging, uh, May Thurner, where you can actually see the compression of vein, that was um, something that's developed recently. And then also in, in si certain situations where we want to size uh, for the devices. Where's the pointer on this thing? Um, this is an image of just how with that probe in the middle um, here, you're transmitting that signal and you just heard all the physics related to that. So it's interpreting that and what it gives us, in this case, this is the blood flow. Here's a plaque in the artery. In this case, in the iliac, you can see the media and then the adventitia around that. So in this case, with a something in the range of about eight megahertz where most of these catheters work for an iliac artery, you're able to, again, see this transmural view. And so that's been very important in interpreting a lot of this stuff, particularly stent function and how things work over time. Um, and there's two different variations in those catheters available. One is where this element actually rotates around, and it, in that case, the image is a little bit in front of the probe, or where, uh, and this is one I'll be showing you the most of, where it actually goes directly out from the side of that catheter, so you're imaging right at the point where you see it. Um, the, these then have translated in clinical practice. There's one, a monorail device, and when you have the wire alongside of that imaging element, I'll show you, you get an artifact from that. So the one that we like to use the most is this prototype uh, here and most of the clinical ones now where it's over the wire. So the imaging elements are right in here. This is where you're going to generate and this will pass over a wire as you go through the blood vessel. There's also some other catheters, bigger diameter ones that uh, treat, you can make these as big as you want. Obviously, you can make a gastroscope out of this if you want. So. Uh, but this one, the ice catheter, is one that fits in the aorta where you don't have to work it over a wire. There's not too much of that available at the moment. So uh, you just heard a good talk about the various wavelengths and what you see. And this is an example in the aorta here of a 20 megahertz. So you don't see very much beyond this. You can see sort of a branch, but it's very hard to interpret it. When you come down to about 12 and a half, now we can get some depth beyond that. And as I'll show you, most of the images beyond that I'll show you are with an eight megahertz probe. So you can actually see out quite some distance, even in the aorta. This is an older image, but it becomes part of uh, what we use in a routinely in, in the OR is to set up, we've got a fluoro and then the ivus right next to that and put it in a position where you can see that image because as you're, Alan's talking about image fusion, it's, it's tying up uh, all of these things conceptually in your mind or what we're gonna be able to do on the imaging panel. So I'll just show you some examples. This is in peripheral arteries. Um, 
this is an iliac artery again. So these, this is the blood, the red cells as they're going by. In this case, here's the ultrasound, and, and there's a wire here. So this is the wire artifact. Here's the media in that blood vessel. You don't always see it, but in this case, it's pretty apparent, and then the adventitia around there. Uh, in a diseased artery where there's calcification, that stops the signal you heard, you know, same as bone. It won't transmit any of that signal or very little of it. So it stops it. You can tell here there's calcification, so there's nothing we can interpret behind that. Here's the, the probe in the middle, the wire artifact, the blood flow, and then here's some relatively normal looking artery and then the calcification. Up here, just a little bit distal, here's a blood clot kind of behind one of these lesions, so you can see this and interpret it as thrombus. So there's a lot of information that you get out of just looking at those ultrasound images alone. This is in a uh, iliac artery where on an angiogram, uh, this was interpreted as sort of a minimal obstruction, but when you look at the ultrasound images, this is the iliac artery here, it's pretty wide open. Uh, this is the wire artifact again. When you bring it down here to this point B, this is actually right critically what they were talking about, a 70% stenosis. And you can see the narrowing here compared to the normal artery with the plaque around it and then distally that artery. So early on it was apparent that the ultrasound was giving us new information about where is the plaque, how does it compare to the angiogram, and gives you that more, not three-dimensional, but a two-dimensional view of it. Um, this is a, uh, another vessel view. Uh, this was, looked like a normal vessel on an angiogram, and when you look here, this is the lumen. There's blood clot out here. So this is an aneurysmal segment that's got blood clot in the wall, and that gives you an idea, again, of how you get additional information from the IVUS. So another picture here, ultrasound probe, the media, and again, what you can see. Next slide. There, there has been an attempt over time to do this, uh, to make three-dimensional reconstructions out of this. So this is the axial images, stacking these up in a longitudinal view, and then even here a three-dimensional. This is not developed as quickly as some of the other, and probably because, as you'll see later, I think going upstairs, there's better ways to put these together. Uh, can you advance that again? Um, when you get to the bigger arteries, and this is where we use it like a, a, um, in the aorta, here's the aortic lumen, the renal vein going across the top of the uh, aorta, and then here's a renal artery, some plaque there. And you also see here there's, there's a, a, a lesion in the aorta right at a renal orifice here. So uh, an example of what you see in a bigger vessel with that 8 megahertz probe. Advance it again, please. Uh, this is a 3D reconstruction attempt through here, an aneurysm, the neck. Here you can see that in the aneurysm itself, some calcification, which would be down here, and then along the vessels. Uh, so another 3D. Uh, on the left-hand side is a, a CT angiogram, and then uh, this is a show you, when you put the catheter through a vessel, it's like any other catheter technology. If it's got tortuosity in it, sometimes it's gonna be in the middle of the vessel, sometimes it's gonna be off to the side. And this is important in the interpretation of the IVUS because you then get uh, images that are near one wall and far from the other, or it can be angled. So there are imaging artifacts that you have to be able to interpret in that. And uh, what, what we normally do with that um, is figure out where, uh, you can stop advancing it for a second. <laughs> uh, this is a, uh, an image of uh, a lesion in the aorta, and this is a big soft plaque that was sitting there. This is after a stent's been positioned, so you can see the stent struts here. It sort of smashed that thing out against it. And so it's been used, and these are just sort of over time what we've been able to use it and figure out how it fits into a patient application. It's very good for identifying vascular graft material. So if you're putting in an endograft and you can't tell whether there's an old intervention or not, uh, you can see that graph very clearly. Uh, the May Thurner scenario, uh, as I mentioned to you, this has been very useful in the iliac vein, particularly 
where there's compression. Uh, this is after uh, the vessel has been treated with a stent and then it, with recurrence of just intimal hyperplasia in there, you can see the lumen here. And the newer systems measure that and quantitate the size of that constriction. Um, in a traumatic transection, we'll move up higher in the aorta. This is a place that's very useful uh, because these patients usually come in, they're hypotensive, so their aorta, in a younger patient, they don't have the pressure in it to be able to, to get it out to the full size. We want to size an endograft. So once these patients get to the OR, we actually use that to uh, size it uh, when they're more fully expanded. And about 20 or 30 percent of the patients, this really has affected the sizing of the endograft that we put in. So that's another place where we use the IVUS preferentially. And this, this shows you here the, the aorta above. Uh, this is again now, you get, it's in an angle. So this would be the diameter down at the area where the, the aorta has been disrupted and then further. So we can localize those lesions and treat them. Uh, you advance it again. Next slide. Go ahead and advance this. We're going to run out of time. Is one other thing I want to. Next slide. Um, in dissections, we use this a lot, as I mentioned. Next slide. And this is a, a patient's aorta. So in the dissection, what happens is there's an entry point. We talk about blood flow through that. Here's the adventitia. This is where this gets peeled away. So what you see with the ultrasound probe in this true lumen, here's the true lumen, here's the false lumen. In this case, you can also, the other thing you get out of the IVUS is a grayscale quantitation of flow. So when the flow slows down a little bit, you get this pattern, and then that's very useful to know when we've covered entry sites. Here's another IVUS picture. Here's the ultrasound probe. This is the true lumen. So this is in a patient with malperfusion. Everything's going through the false lumen there. And here with the ultrasound probe and the true, once we cover the entry point, what happens, this is normally pulsatile with uh, systole. Once we reperfuse that, that's where it occurs. And I'll show you on a video image here. These are the still pictures first. Um, so up here near the subclavian artery, we can identify that the, the entry tear has started there, just down a little further. Now we've got a true and false lumen. And as we get down towards the, uh, the visceral vessels, here's complete collapse. So that's why this patient's got malperfusion. And it actually works, Ronco's life here. Um, and uh, this shows you the malperfusion. Um, yeah, good. So this is the IVUS probe. Up, here's the subclavian. We're pulling this back. Here's a nominate carotid subclavian. Here's the tear. So what you see with this ultrasound probe, the pulsatility is in that false lumen. You can see here with the heartbeat how that collapses. And as we come down further through the aorta, you get close to a tear down here. You see how dynamic that flap is. Um, and as we get down here in a moment at those visceral vessels, it'll be completely collapsed. So that's the view that we get. And this lets us know when we're treating a dissection, we're in the true lumen. That's where we want to put the endograft. Here it's completely collapsed. So at the viscerals, there's celiac, SMA, and the renal. There's the renal vein and the renals. So in that patient, then, uh, what we're able to do uh, with the endograft is place that here, you can see the endograft, and we can look with the IVUS again. Here's the struts across that, uh, right at the carotid. Here, the subclavian's covered. It's mostly open, but what's happened then, uh, as we go through this, is the, uh, I'll run this. This is after we put the endograft in now. There's a nominate carotid. Here's the struts on that subclavian's covered. And you'll see this, the endograft is not completely open, but it gives you the idea of how it treats that and transmits then the pressure back into the true lumen. Here's the endograft, and a minute will come out of it down below that, and you'll see now the true lumen is pulsatile. This false lumen is partially collapsed, and then we get down, there's visceral vessels, and everything's open. So it, it gives us an idea immediately of what's going on in those patients. Um, we use that also to identify branch vessels, um, and I won't play this video, but we can line that up with a celiac and then put the endograft. And I want to show you one other thing here to finish. In the ascending, 
Uh, and you have a program like this too for ascending graphs. Uh, we use the IVUS in combination with the TE as you've seen that. Uh, it's an important technology. This is a 3D rendering of a patient who had, he was an extremis, went to the OR and on the TE, we were able to see here uh, that positioning. We thought we could cover this with an endograph. The IVUS we use then to make sure we're in the true lumen. So here's the uh, IVUS probe. There, here we are above the aortic valve with the end, so we want to make sure it connects through to the head on top. Here as we come up through the arch, before we put the endograft in, we want to make sure that we've got brachiocephalic flow, and here this confirms it's going up in there. And this is after the endograft in on the TE, uh, the IVUS in combination with that at the coronaries and this patient, and then uh, this is a 30-day follow-up on this. So, we were talking about this yesterday, but the combination of those, uh, when you fuse them like Alan wants to do in the OR, is going to be a way to be able to tell where we are and place these things accurately. So uh, with that, I'm out of time. Thank you.